In the year 1099 AD, the Crusaders captured Jerusalem, and for over a hundred years, the city remained under the rule of European feudal lords. During this time, the European continent was marked by brutal oppression, leaving the common people in dire straits. Jerusalem, on the other hand, became a place where some nobles could amass wealth, and where commoners sought redemption. On a particular day, a knight named Godfrey de Ibelin returned from Jerusalem to his homeland in France in search of his family. This knight, who was a baron, held his own estates in Jerusalem. Through a conversation with his French brother, he learned that his illegitimate son was living outside the city as a blacksmith. This blacksmith is our protagonist, Balian de Ibelin. Balian de Ibelin, a retired soldier, had fought for the interests of one lord against another. After hanging up his armor, he became a blacksmith. However, fate took a twist, as his wife died in despair after the loss of their child, leading her to commit suicide. Balian de Ibelin's half-brother, a priest, gives Balian de Ibelin's wife a simple funeral, but he has always coveted Balian de Ibelin's meager fortune. Under his brother's guidance, Baron Godfrey de Ibelin found Balian de Ibelin and revealed the truth of their past. He told Balian de Ibelin that he was his father and urged him to accompany him back to Jerusalem. He promised Balian de Ibelin that he would inherit the Baron's position and live a worry-free life. However, Balian de Ibelin, who had just lost his wife, flatly refused the reunion. The death of his wife had left him emotionally numb. That night, Balian de Ibelin's brother approached him again, persuading him to go to Jerusalem. He provoked Balian de Ibelin by claiming that his wife's suicide was a sinful act, and that she had been beheaded and was condemned to hell, unable to enter heaven. Hearing this, Balian de Ibelin became enraged and noticed that his brother was carrying his wife's cross. In a fit of anger, he stabbed his brother to death, took back the cross that belonged to his wife, and set the blacksmith's shop on fire before riding off on his horse. Balian de Ibelin caught up with the departing party of Godfrey de Ibelin and expressed his willingness to go to the holy city of Jerusalem. He confessed to having committed murder and hoped to seek redemption for himself and his wife there. In a way, this could be seen as an indirect acknowledgement of their father-son relationship. The group set up camp and rested in a forest. During this time, Godfrey de Ibelin continued to instruct Balian de Ibelin in swordsmanship. As they engaged in friendly sparring, a sudden attack with a cold blade struck killing one of the followers instantly. Soon after, a mounted troop emerged from the forest. They were none other than Godfrey de Ibelin's nephew, who claimed to have come to apprehend Balian de Ibelin for killing the priest. In reality, their intention was to eliminate both Balian de Ibelin and his father. According to the traditions of the time, they would inherit Godfrey de Ibelin's barren position if they succeeded. However, Godfrey de Ibelin would not hand over Balian de Ibelin. A fierce battle was inevitable, but for Godfrey de Ibelin, a seasoned warrior, actions spoke louder than words. The opposing forces were well prepared, and amidst the chaos of the battle, although Godfrey de Ibelin was struck by an arrow, he managed to defeat his opponents. With the fight over, casualties were heavy on both sides. Unfortunately, luck was not on Godfrey de Ibelin's side as the arrow had deeply pierced his bone marrow. His condition worsened, and after struggling to travel a distance, he finally succumbed to his injuries. In his final moments, he passed on the title and position to Balian de Ibelin, knighting him, and admonishing him to uphold the chivalric code. Although his father had passed away, the journey to Jerusalem must go on. Prior to departing, one of the elderly knights in Godfrey de Ibelin's service had other matters to attend to and could not accompany Balian de Ibelin. After some instructions, Balian de Ibelin embarked on a solo voyage to Jerusalem. The voyage itself was fraught with perils, and a shipwreck occurred along the way. Balian de Ibelin was the only survivor along with a horse. Just as Balian de Ibelin was preparing to continue his journey, he encountered two Arab men. Through the translation of his black-clad servant, he learned that the elegantly dressed Arab claimed ownership of the horse, stating that it was his territory. With no other options, Bailey and de Ibelin resorted to the customary method of resolving disputes at the time, a duel. In the end, Bailey and de Ibelin proved superior in skill and defeated the Arab, subsequently subduing the black-clad servant. However, he did not take more lives than necessary. Instead, he instructed the black-clad servant to lead the way to the holy city of Jerusalem. After several days of traveling, the two of them arrived in the holy city of Jerusalem. The city was bustling with people and filled with excitement. Bailey and de Ibelin not only released the black-clad servant but also gave his own horse to him as a gesture of goodwill. Before parting ways, the black-clad servant expressed his gratitude, believing that good deeds would be rewarded. Following that, Bailey and de Ibelin's first action was to visit the burial site of Jesus, where he prayed for his wife hoping to cleanse both her and himself of their sins. He also buried his wife's belongings there as a way to find solace for his own soul. In the bustling marketplace, he encountered Almeric, 
one of his father's subordinates. Almeric had already heard the news of Godfrey de Ibelin's death and recognized Balian de Ibelin as the rightful heir through the sword he carried. Almeric accompanied Balian de Ibelin to the Baron's estate, where Balian de Ibelin inherited everything. Not long after, Balian de Ibelin was summoned by King Baldwin of Jerusalem. At this time, King Baldwin was afflicted with leprosy and aware of his impending demise. After a conversation with Balian de Ibelin, he held him in high regard. Balian de Ibelin's performance impressed King Baldwin, and he successfully inherited his father's lands in Ibelin. In the eyes of Almeric, this barren land held potential, and it aligned with Balian de Ibelin's aspirations. He was determined to make something out of it and not disappoint his father's expectations, through clearing the land and digging wells. After much hard work, the once neglected estate slowly regained its vitality. During this time, Balian de Ibelin coincidentally met the kingdom's princess. The princess fell in love with Balian de Ibelin at first sight. Although she had been previously married and had a son, her affection for Balian de Ibelin couldn't be concealed. Meanwhile, the kingdom of Jerusalem, ruled by King Baldwin, was facing instability. His policy of maintaining friendly relations with the Muslims was under threat. Despite his strategic brilliance, his deteriorating health prevented him from effectively managing the situation. Within the kingdom, the Templar Knights, led by the English sergeant, held the most power. They constantly incited conflicts, hoping to provoke another crusade. With bishops' manipulations, they plundered Arab caravans, causing tensions to rise. Although the Knights of the Hospital Regent Guardian is on the king's side, the two factions have always been at odds. The current dispute arose from the English sergeant's raid on an Arab caravan, giving Saladin, the ruler of the Ayyubid dynasty, a pretext to mobilize his forces against Jerusalem. At this moment, Saladin's army was advancing towards Jerusalem, and the region where Balian de Ibelin was located was the first to come under attack. In order to protect the civilians and suppress Saladin's offensive, King Baldwin of Jerusalem reluctantly led his forces into battle and assigned Balian de Ibelin to protect the evacuation of the people. On the other side, Balian de Ibelin had learned of Saladin's approach. In order to buy more time for the people to escape, Balian de Ibelin could only lead his small group of a few dozen men to confront Saladin's army head-on. It was evident that this would be a one-sided battle. After only a few rounds, Balian de Ibelin and his men were captured. The reason they were not immediately executed was because the opposing commander was the black-clad servant whom Balian de Ibelin had spared earlier. Just then, a cloud of dust rose in the distance, followed by fluttering banners as King Baldwin himself arrived with his army. Since Saladin's forces had just arrived and had not yet established a stable foothold, a full-scale battle did not erupt. Under King Baldwin's strong stance, Saladin had no choice but to retreat for the time being, and Balian de Ibelin escaped unharmed. Upon their return, King Baldwin severely punished the mastermind behind the plunder, the Templar Knight Bishop. However, the exertion took a toll on King Baldwin, worsening his condition, and his time was running out. The Archbishop, who had remained by his side, urged him to make his final confession. However, King Baldwin informed the Archbishop that he would confess to the Lord himself when the time came. This demonstrates that King Baldwin was a devout Christian, while Catholic believers confessed to priests. Later, King Baldwin summoned Balian de Ibelin once again. Impressed by his bravery, King Baldwin intended to betroth the princess to Balian de Ibelin and transfer military authority to him, hoping that he would assist the new king in his reign. However, Balian de Ibelin politely declined King Baldwin's offer. Firstly, it went against the true spirit of knighthood. And secondly, with the current formidable enemy, the English sergeant, who had a betrothal to the princess, would not easily surrender. This could lead to internal strife providing an opportunity for Saladin to take advantage. Later, the princess learned about Balian de Ibelin's decision and was highly puzzled. King Baldwin eventually passed away and, in history, at the age of 16, led a few hundred cavalry and 3,000 infantry to launch a surprise attack on Saladin's mercenary force of 30,000, achieving a resounding victory. However, he ultimately succumbed to leprosy at the young age of 24. Death might have been a release for him. After King Baldwin's passing, the princess's son ascended to the throne. As the princess assisted her son in governing, she noticed that something was amiss with him as well. He showed no reaction when scalding oil dripped on his hand, and he felt no pain when doctors pricked his feet with needles. Eventually, the princess confirmed that her son also suffered from leprosy. Thinking of her brother's body ravaged by the disease and the torment he endured, she couldn't bear to see her son don the same mask of suffering. She chose to relieve him by administering poison. Only a mother can truly understand the pain and choices she had to make. Consequently, her fiancé, the English sergeant, naturally ascended to the throne. The arrogant English sergeant, feeling entitled, released his imprisoned ally, Bishop, 
who was tasked with provoking a war against the Muslims, Bishop excelled at such actions, promptly slaughtering an Arab village, including Saladin's own sister. This time, Saladin truly became infuriated, but he still sent an emissary as a gesture of goodwill before taking up arms. The emissary demanded that the English sergeant hand over the perpetrator and surrender Jerusalem. However, the English sergeant killed the emissary. As the saying goes, do not kill the messenger in times of war. The English sergeant's behavior was unbecoming, and he subsequently gathered his army and marched towards Saladin's encampment outside the distant city. In the meantime, Bailey and Ibelin attempted to advise the English sergeant. Despite their conflicting interests, he couldn't just stand idly by and watch hundreds of thousands of soldiers march to their deaths in vain. Given the current situation, it was wiser to defend Jerusalem. Launching a preemptive strike would only fall into Saladin's trap. However, the haughty English sergeant refused to heed Bailey and Ibelin's counsel and proceeded with leading his massive army. In the scorching heat and endless yellow sands, the ill-prepared army of the English sergeant, lacking logistical water supplies, fell into disarray during their long march and could not continue as a cohesive force. On the other side, the Muslim camp was filled with high morale, and the outcome was predictable. Vultures filled the sky, and corpses littered the field. The English sergeant suffered a crushing defeat and was captured. Muslims had a tradition of not slaughtering another ruler, so Saladin didn't directly execute the English sergeant. Instead, he offered him a cup of iced water. The English sergeant, without hesitation, passed the cup directly to Bishop standing beside him, who drank it down. It was also his last drink in this world. Saladin spared the English sergeant but didn't show mercy to Bishop. He had him dragged away and executed by beheading. After the major battle, Bailey and Ibelin and others arrived at the battlefield. Although they had already anticipated the result, they were still shocked by the gruesome scene before them. Tiberius, who had lost confidence in Jerusalem's current situation, took his group of knights and went to Cyprus. At this time, Jerusalem still had hundreds of thousands of elderly, weak, and defenseless people, as well as scattered militias. Bailey and Ibelin couldn't bear to see them slaughtered on the day the city fell. He took it upon himself, using his title as a baron, to order the few remaining soldiers to defend the city. Only through a fight to the death could they hope to regain a glimmer of hope. Without knights leading the defense, he improvised and knighted soldiers on the spot. These unconventional measures stirred up everyone's determination to fight to the death. Additionally, Bailey and Ibelin used his previous battle experience to precisely measure and mark the outside of the city. This allowed the trebuchets inside the city to obtain accurate parameters for counterattacks, making the most of the limited time for preparations before the major battle. In the deep of night, Saladin's army pressed closer, and their vanguard launched fire attacks with catapults, causing smoke to billow within the city. However, Saladin did not initiate a siege. As the sun rose the next day, the Muslim army performed their morning prayers facing the direction of the holy city. With an imposing force of over 200,000 soldiers, Jerusalem seemed within their grasp. The siege battle erupted, and the Muslim army advanced slowly and orderly. When they reached the white stone markers, Bailey and Ibelin ordered the trebuchets inside the city to counterattack, accurately striking the enemy with unwavering accuracy. In the following 300 yards, 200 yards, the Muslim army suffered continuous losses, but it was only a depletion of their forces. They quickly reached the city walls, and a fierce battle of attack and defense ensued. The area below the city was filled with a sea of people, while the soldiers on the walls fought desperately. Bailey and Ibelin's command continuously resolved the immediate crisis. One day passed, and Saladin did not gain an advantage in the initial attack. Instead, both sides suffered heavy losses. On the second day, the attack became more intense. As Saladin deployed all his siege towers, the city walls were temporarily breached. In a critical moment, Bailey and Ibelin cut down the Muslim flag planted on the city walls and unleashed his secret weapon, a giant spear designed specifically to counter siege towers. The giant spear pierced into the tower, with a massive stone weight on the other end, causing the tower to lose balance and topple over one by one. The attacking forces below the city became chaotic, and even Saladin, who was observing from a distance, didn't expect such a difficult situation. With the loss of the siege towers, the siege was a complete failure. After days of fighting, both sides suffered heavy losses, and the battlefield was filled with piles of corpses. Saladin looked at the fallen soldiers before him and couldn't help but feel sorrow. Perhaps he never imagined that even after paying such a heavy price, Jerusalem would remain unyielding. At this moment, one of Saladin's generals received information that the old city of Jerusalem was relatively weak and could be breached by catapults, creating a breach. Bailey and Ibelin also realized this, and he knew this would be the final decisive battle. Indeed, on the third day, Saladin ordered the attack. 
concentrating their firepower on the old city gates and walls. Under the continuous bombardment of projectiles, the old city gates and walls didn't hold up for long before collapsing. Both sides quickly rushed towards the breach. Although Saladin had the numerical advantage, Bailey and Diabolin had no way out. If the city fell, death was certain. He vowed to fight to the death, declaring that if they wanted to pass, they would have to step over his dead body. In an instant, the massive breach appeared narrow amid the surging forces. After a day of fierce fighting, the breach was filled with a dense mass of corpses. After a wave of attacks, Saladin halted the assault. The cost of such a deadly battle was too high. Ultimately, he chose to negotiate. Considering the historical fact of Muslim conquests leading to massacres, Bailey and Diabolin took a slightly firm stance during the negotiations, pledging to live or die with Jerusalem. Saladin, on the other hand, stated that he only wanted the holy city and promised to release all the people inside. This was precisely what Bailey and Diabolin had fought for, to protect the people from being slaughtered. Seeing Saladin willing to negotiate, Bailey and Diabolin immediately agreed. When he asked Saladin about the value of the holy city, Saladin responded, War has brought peace in the end. Saladin fulfilled his promise and released all the people and soldiers within the city. Meanwhile, the former English king, the sergeant, who was wandering the streets, challenged Balian de Ibelin. After a fight, he was defeated by Balian de Ibelin's hands. But Balian de Ibelin didn't kill him, he only threatened him, saying that if he were to be knighted again, Balian de Ibelin would kill him. Amidst the flow of people leaving Jerusalem, Balian de Ibelin found the princess, who appeared somewhat disheveled. In the end, Bailey and Diabolin returned to his homeland in France with the princess, and the two of them lived a peaceful life. There was even a small episode. King Richard the Lionheart of England personally led a large army to seize the holy city of Jerusalem and specifically sought out Bailey and Diabolin. However, Bailey and Diabolin declined King Richard's request, stating that he was just a blacksmith. In the following three years, King Richard's expedition to Jerusalem failed to recapture the holy city, and they eventually reached a truce with Saladin. And thus, the movie concludes. I am a movie enthusiast. Feel free to subscribe to my channel. See you in the next episode.